Uh, hello again. Uh, as you, as many of you might remember, uh, uh, last November uh, we were in this same place, and Helga Tseplarouche presented an idea to how to deal with the danger of war in Southwest Asia, and also with the uh, terrible developments in Syria and the barbaric attack on actually not only on Syrian people but on a whole culture, a whole civilization from inside Syria, and also the threat of an attack on Iran. And so Helga. Tseplarouche presented a concept for how to find a, a common goal for all nations to work together for, and I and uh, some of my colleagues, uh, we collaborated to elaborate what we, could present, uh, what we could present as a solution and also as a goal to unite the nations of the region, but also to get international uh, powers who are now in, actually, they will end up in conflict, like the United States, uh, the whole British Empire, uh, in conflict with China and Russia will lead to a world war. Now, this is the original uh, idea, and then we had this discussion about how we could deal with the threat from the, uh, the, the world deserts, which is an extension of desert to, uh, from Africa to Asia, which is a threat to societies and also it's a threat to many societies and also how to work both scientifically, politically, economically to limit the effect of the desert and eventually green the desert. And that this would be a planetary uh, program where all nations can cooperate. Uh, so the details of course of this are in the previous conference, I'm not gonna go through them. I, I want just to show you what progress has been done. Uh, just to be forewarned that this project will not be cannot be implemented today as it is. It's impossible right now to finance any uh, infrastructure project or industrial project of this magnitude or even any other magnitude because of the present financial and economic system. So the first prerequisite would be to eliminate the current financial system by what Lyndon LaRouche said, solving the mystery of money with a glass steagle. Uh, and that is the first uh, uh, the requirement. The second requirement is that the question of peace to stop all these wars, that the, the nations of the region cannot stop these wars. Uh, I mean, there's nothing Syria can do other than defending itself to stop the war. Libya could not do anything to stop the invasion against Libya. Iraq could not do anything because there was an intention, there was a policy to invade Iraq. There was a policy which was not Saddam Hussein's intention. And it's the same thing for Gaddafi. There is also an intention to attack Iran. Iran cannot do anything to stop an attack on Iran or a war, uh, you know, other than trying to defend themselves. And it reminds me of the story of the, uh, a young man who was overrun by a car, and his father went to the prison to meet the, the driver, you know, and, and to say why he did that. And the driver said, well, I tried to warn your kid. Uh, you know, I, I, I honked for him, I sent a signal with the light, I waved for him, but he could not get out of the way. So he went to the hospital and he, told his son, you know, the driver says he did all these things to get you out of the way. And, and the boy said, well, I, I know he did these things, but where, how can I get out of the way? I was sitting in, a, in the restaurant. <laughs> so these nations are sitting there. They can't get out, out of the way for, for a war. So anyway, uh, we have been having discussions with, the, with actually government rep representatives in the region, uh, we, with experts, with the organizations. Uh, you know, to bring this idea into the forum of discussions when people try to talk about solving political problems because we cannot have peace without economic development. And that this should be included in every uh, peace initiative. And I would also, it's very important that Russia, China, uh, other nations who discuss with the United States or Europe, any, any discussion about peace in Southwest Asia should include and must include uh, a, a perspective for improving the living conditions of the population. Uh, so in, in the process of getting that, I, will, I have a message uh, will show after my presentation uh, from an Iraqi official. Uh, so we have been getting in contact with many uh, officials and uh, experts on water and desert desertification and so on. So, I mean, it's these things, of course, as I said, we have to have a new economic order. We have to stop the war policy, as Lynn and uh, Sayer said, with, by impeaching Obama. But we cannot wait for the future. You know, like people wait for a bus to come and get on the bus. We have to build the bus. We have to prepare the future. So in, in that process, we, the first qualitative response we got uh, from Helga's and my presentation and that we had actually a campaign was the first qualitative 
uh, response was from the Iranian government. Uh, Helga and I were invited in March uh, to a conference organized by the Iranian Foreign Ministries uh, International Center for Political Studies uh, and uh, to present these ideas and to present what we think that the conference was about the security of the Persian Gulf after the Arab Spring and revolutions and what implications that have. So um, uh, unfortunately Helga could not attend the conference. Uh, I attended the conference but Helga's paper was published in the conference uh, with the conference papers. Uh, so the, the, the problem with the, in the conference that all the discussions, which reflects the danger in the region, all the discussions were about the threat of the sectarian war, the geopolitics, you know, and the Shia, Sunni, and, and all these horrible things that uh, take place. So it is true that people are living inside that hell right now, and they, of course, they, they, it's difficult for them to see a solution other than trying to survive and maneuver within that situation. But uh, I, I had the chance to speak and present our idea, but I actually started by uh, bringing up the, the meteorite uh, explosion over Chelyabinsk uh, to the audience and uh, to uh, get their attention. Uh, but then when I presented the perspective for greening the deserts and the Eurasian land bridge as the Schiller Institute peace plan, uh, people were completely, you know, th there was a change in their mind because, you know, people are down there looking at the horrors of war but then you bring them to a higher platform to see the world from a different stand, uh, viewpoint, then the, the mind opens up and say, well, great, why didn't, we, why didn't we think about that ourselves? So I think th this is the impact of getting these kind of ideas and get out of the smaller issues and get into the global uh, planetary uh, uh, aspect of it. This conference was... Uh, organized not in Tehran in the capital, but in Bandar Abbas, which is a city. This is the governor of Hormuzgan. Uh, we have, I have an interview with him. It's in the EIR and a report from, my, um, from the conference. Uh, he's, uh, the, Hormuzgan is the province which controls, uh, this is the, where Bandar Abbas is on our Eurasian land bridge. And it also controls the islands which lay on the Hormuz Strait, the very important uh, Hormuz Strait. Uh, there was this discussion yesterday about the flow of oil from there. Uh, I th the Gulf stands for 40%. The Persian Gulf, people call it the Arab Gulf on the Arab side, the Iranians call it the Persian Gulf. But 40% of all oil exports from the Gulf to the international markets go through the Hormuz Strait. 90%, as I said yesterday, go, through, uh, go to primarily China, Japan, South Korea, uh, India. Uh, Japan increased its import of oil as a way of diversifying there because this is the easiest and quickest way to get more energy after F Fukushima uh, to import more oil from the Gulf. So they're getting more dependent on that. And it's in that narrow area uh, where all this uh, is taking place. This is the direction of shipping. It's uh, 50 kilometers all the way from there in, in, the, in the strait. And also you can, you know, I visited these islands uh, on the Iranian side. Uh, but you, you can see that this is one of the most important and most sensitive areas in, in world, you know, in navigation in the world and transport in the world. Uh, but also, it also can become one of the most terrible places on earth. I mean, when American aircraft carriers pass by, by, pass by there, people can see them from the Iranian side. And I think somebody was telling me that there might be a, a hotline between American and Iranian military or indirect hotline to avoid that an accident could lead to a major uh, outbreak of, uh, you know, uh, of fire. Uh, and that would, could lead to an uh, outbreak of war. So this is the Hormuz, on the Hormuz um, uh, Strait is, is very, very important. And it has the potential of creating, because you have in these, uh, these three islands, uh, the, the Greater Tomb, the Lesser Tomb, and Abu Musa, these are contested by Iran and the United Arab Emirates. The Emirates say, claim that these are, belong to them and the Iranians, they have, Iranians have sovereignty there. This was a British game. In 1971, when the British left, they handed over the place, or not handed over, but they let the Shah of Iran take over these islands. And now the British are encouraging the United Arab Emirates to take it back. <laughs> so uh, it, the Hormuz Strait has the potential of becoming a major uh, break, uh, breakout point for war. Uh, now, Hormuzgan and uh, that Iranian province uh, is one of the fastest growing provinces in Iran. 
uh, because in uh, as was in the map there that they they have the Iranian government have built a railway which extends from uh, uh, northern Iran to Bandar Abbas, and they built uh, this uh, port, uh, Shahid Rajai container ship uh, port. It's one of a very very large port, and now uh, many nations in Central Asia are totally dependent on cargo. Uh, uh, and trade going from Bandar Abbas, uh, coming from Asia and elsewhere, to the landlocked countries in Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. So this has become one of the most vital trade uh, uh, routes uh, between uh, the Indian Ocean region and Central Asia. Now the Iranians, uh, we can call this the Silk Road strategy, the Iranians have been, in spite of all uh, uh, economic sanctions, uh, threats, and so on. They have been very consistent on building uh, infrastructure projects which have a continental, transcontinental significance. Uh, in 1996, they built this small section here to connect to the old Soviet uh, uh, railway system and to China. China had simultaneously built a connection to Kazakhstan, so the old Silk Road was rebuilt. And later, Iran built this connection to Turkey, so Europe and Asia were connected through this. Now they are building, uh, this was uh, built in 2004, and then there is the North-South Corridor, which goes from Russia to India. There is an agreement between Russia, Iran, and India to build a trade route through the Caucasus, through the Iranian railway network, and this is being built right now to Chabahar on the uh, Arabian Sea. Uh, I India is very interested in this because shipping by sea, it takes about three weeks to the um, to the, Red, to the Black Sea, while with the railway system to Russia it takes one week. So this is an enormous change. So anyway, the Iranian strategy has been to position it themselves uh, in an economic way, in a peaceful economic way, to make other nations dependent on them for their trade and livelihood. And this is a very good uh, strategic defense uh, method. They're also building gas pipelines to Turkey, and they have just built a gas pipeline to Pakistan, which is very important to get Pakistan on board to solve the problem in Afghanistan and leave the Anglo-Saudi party, which is destabilizing Iran by creating economic cooperation. So th this is part of the general idea of, uh, of getting um, uh, an economic... And most of the Iranian officials in the conference, actually, they were speaking about getting an agreement in the Gulf uh, among all the Gulf countries, uh, a peace agreement based on economic cooperation and also cultural cooperation. So they all realize now that the, the way to get out of this is not religious agreements, it's not strategic or geopolitical agreements, but economic, uh, economic dependency among nations. And I want to talk just about the sanctions. You pay attention not to the gentleman in the picture, but to these uh, boat, these ships there. This is uh, I was going to the Hormuz Island by ferry, and then there are many many ships in the sea just standing there. Uh, and there was a man sitting next to me from the customs, and he said these ships they are not there waiting for something. They are just parked there because of the economic sanctions. And he said Iran's 2,000 kilometer coast there are about 5,000 major ships standing still because of the economic sanctions. Because the Iranian, because Iranian central bank cannot con have contact with international banks and the ships cannot pay, get these letters of credit, they cannot get insurance. So this is an enormous loss for Iran, but also an enormous loss for world trade. So this is a, uh, I mean in Iran, in spite of that, the, the Iranians are building uh, the Iranians are hit hard by the sanctions. The Iranian currency have gone down 300% uh, uh, against uh, the dollar. Uh, capital is flying from the country. Young people are trying also to find ways to go out of the country to find a job and a future. So, but in spite of that, the Iranians are trying with the little resources they have to do something for their country to, you know, with the hope that there will be peace, that their country will be able to continue its economic development. All right, I just wanted to show you the, the insanity of the current economic system. On the other side of the Gulf, we have, like, this is Dubai. These are the allies of the British. Uh, and it's beside being one of the large uh, uh, drug money laundering centers in the world, it's also the shopping capital of the world. But it's a very completely arid country. Uh, and this is not...
built by the rich Arabs. This was one of the biggest uh, Ponzi schemes uh, in, in modern history because the, the Dubai, Dubai, they don't have uh, much resources. Abu Dhabi has the resources, the neighboring city. But in order to build these things, they were selling future projects to investors on brochures. So this is one of their ideas. Instead of greening the desert, they offer people to build artificial islands in the sea for tourists, uh, nightclubs, shopping centers, and so on and so forth. And this was, you know, you have all these fancy things. Uh, by dredging the uh, sand and building artificial islands, actually the environmentalist movement said nothing about this because they were burying all the corals on the, on the side, but the environmentalists didn't say anything about it. But this is, for example, one of the projects they tried to sell in 2006 uh, that you, you have artificial islands and you can buy a country and build whatever you want on that country. So this was sold in 2006. 70% uh, of it was sold to international so-called developers, uh, billionaires and so on. Uh, but this was the, how the brochure looked like. Uh, and the, 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 the company in Dubai with the economic crisis hitting it, they were not able to finance anymore uh, and the, the real estate prices in Dubai collapsed in 2008 and then they were not able to get any new money for the future projects to finance the current projects. So this is how it ended up, it's sinking in the, in the sea. There are only two islands which are built and the rest and there are more lawyers working to solve this than engineers because all the people who bought the islands, they can't do anything, there's no infrastructure. And it's also destroying the waters of the Gulf. So there is one more thing in the Gulf we have, which is connected directly to the international financial system, is the so-called sovereign wealth funds. Uh, the Arab sovereign wealth funds, uh, jointly, there is about $2 trillion. And this makes a lot of bankers and financiers in the city of London and Wall Street drool over it. The, the, uh, the one to the, in the bottom is China, which is the largest one in the world, but the Chinese are using their... Uh, capital in a wise way, they are not included in this, but I'm going to just mention like here, the Arab countries were lured into supporting the financial bubble, but also in the bailout bubble. This is a list of the transactions which were made by these sovereign uh, funds uh, in 2000, between 2007 and 2008. Uh, like the Kuwait Investment Authority, they bought shares in the Citigroup, 2012 uh, billion dollars uh, in a uh, Citigroup also, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, $7 billion, Mer Merrill Lynch, Kuwait, $6 billion, and so on and so forth. So uh, all the, these, the uh, oil money and all these things are going. I, I mentioned to our friend from Norway, the Norwegians have the same situation with their oil fund. And this is how, this is called the new global wealth machine. And this is a diagram which shows you where the money comes from and where it ends up. And all, it's all British and Wall Street banks. And then to the left, you have the advisors, they are Lazar, you have uh, uh, all kinds of so-called advisory groups, and you have the lawyers on the right, and these are the people who are advising the Arab Gulf states on financial affairs and where to invest their money. And it's completely British controlled. It's uh, either city of London or Wall Street. And this is where the money went. Uh, these are financial uh, transactions, $160 billion, this is since uh, one, uh, 2008. Real estate, $60 billion, infrastructure and utilities, and this is not building new infrastructure and utilities like Dubai, Dubai Ports Company, they buy ports that are already built in Europe or in the United States. They, didn't, they couldn't buy it in the United States for people in Congress who are talking about national security, and so on and so forth. And the bottom of the, of the list, you have investments in healthcare. So this is where all, all the investments are going for. And the, the, the people who are advising these, as I said, this is the uh, London School of Economics, uh, Mark Thatcher, but this is not the infamous son of Margaret Thatcher, the, the arms dealer. This is another infamous Mark Thatcher who works in the London School of Economics. And it's an interesting study because he says Brit Britain, the United Kingdom, are the, the, they get most investments from the Arab countries because they, have, they follow free trade. In the United States, they get very little money because they they are more cautious about national security and allowing the Arabs to come into their uh, system. But they, in spite of that, they did pay. Uh, so this is where how the, the shows run on the Arab side of the play. But, you know, this is not the end of the road. Most of the money is gone, but health, 
with, to hell with the money, there is still, we have nations in, in the region, I mean, in Dubai you still have one of the world's largest airports, you have the largest ports, you have Abu Dhabi, they are building four nuclear power plants with the, uh, with the help of South Korea. So you still have potential for development, and it's not that we are not talking to them, we are trying to talk to these governments on this side of the uh, Gulf, but it's difficult to have a dialogue with Saudi Arabia, for example, when the national security uh, chief is Prince Bandar bin Sultan. He will not allow anybody to talk to us. But, uh, and we have uh, forewarned them before. This is Mr. Lyndon LaRouche in Abu Dhabi in 2002. Mr. LaRouche in that uh, visit, this was a very big conference on oil, uh, the future of oil and international economy. This is the oil minister of, uh, of uh, the United Arab Emirates. And uh, Mr. LaRouche was uh, treated as a, as a guest of honor. And actually, the United States, Britain, New Zealand, uh, Canada, and Australia, all the ambassadors sent letters to the Zayed Center uh, asking them to disinvite Mr. LaRouche, that he should not come to attend this conference. And it, they got even threats, but they, they didn't care about that. Uh, there were some interesting people there at the time. Uh, and Mr. LaRouche, he issued very strong warning to the people in the, in the and there were people from Saudi Arabia, from all the Gulf countries, very important people. Very strong warning about the co coming financial collapse. That was in 2002, and he said we should get to the lifeboats. I remember LaRouche said that because I translated the speech. Uh, but he also, in a very friendly way, advised them on how to invest in their economy by focusing on nuclear power, uh, focusing on petrochemicals instead of selling oil as raw material, uh, greening the, the desert, water desalination, and building a real economic, industrial economic base. Uh, of course, they lost these years, and the whole region has lost these years, as Japan lost 10 years, as, uh, as Europe ha is losing time. And we have been losing time, but the, the issue is that we still can go back there and have a totally new policy, but we have to have a new world economic order based on the principles which we discussed here, the, the Glass-Steagall, and to stop the war policy. Uh, when I was in Bandar Abbas, because if you, you stand somewhere, which is, you see things from a different viewpoint. I think in this region, which I outlined, from Iran to Turkey to Iraq, Syria, the Gulf states, uh, Egypt, Ethiopia, uh, uh, Somalia, and Sudan, in this region you have about 400 million people. And this is a very, very rich people. The, the population is very young. Uh, and uh, actually, in many of these countries, the people are very well educated. But the current policy is not allowing, is killing this region and also killing the possibility for other nations to invest or to have this as a market for both capital goods and, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, uh, consumer goods. I mean, as I said, 90% of the oil in the Gulf goes to Asia. But in return, 80% of all imports, capital goods and consumer goods, also come from Asia. So Asia is actually totally dependent not totally, but dependent to a large extent on trade with this region. But imagine if you develop this region in the correct way, which we are proposing. So you have 400 people with great resources and also a very strategic position between three continents. You can create an economic miracle in that region. So th this is the, the thing. And also, uh, you, you, when you talk to people there and you see the, the children, you see, you know, people love life there. They love beauty. And I was standing in Bandar Abbas on the huge boulevard, and people in Iran, they love to have picnics, but usually have they, they have picnics in the evening because it's hot there. Uh, and you see all these kids playing, and you look at the Hormuz Strait and the water, and you imagine that there is maybe an aircraft carrier next day. You know, it's, it's totally horrendous. Thoughts came to my mind. But people there, they do want to live. They do want to have a future. In the flight from Tehran to Bandar Abbas, uh, there was a young, uh, and I will finish with this, there was a young Iranian man, I think he was 24, 25, sitting next to me. And he was uh, studying a huge map of an electric uh, device or machine. Uh, you know, and he was worried, it seems that he was going there on to work. Uh, and then, before we landed, he took it away and quickly took out the notebook. And he started writing things in Persian. Uh, I'm not good in Persian, I can manage, but... Uh, he was looking out through the window, and then he was writing something and smiling. And then I, from the shape of the, of the lines, I realized that he was writing a poem. And he was smiling and looking through the window and then writing things. 
So, you know, it's, I, it, it, just, it really moved me to see that those young people, I mean, it's not only, and this is where the issue of culture is coming in here, because it's not, you know, it's not material things we are talking about. We are talking about uplifting the human soul. And I think the ingredients are there, both in Iran and in Iraq and in the Arab world. We do have the Renaissance, which we are grateful for the Greeks and Plato to have. But we have the ingredients for progress, for a cultural renaissance in the region. But the problem is that you don't, we don't have a just world economic order. And I think this is the challenge we just presented today, and we have to all work for that end. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a video of uh, Dr. Hassan Janabi. He's Iraq's ambassador to the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome. He couldn't come to the conference, but uh, he, uh, simultaneously as we had the previous conference, he had written a letter to the Iraqi government, an open letter to build the Green Belt, which I had presented also in the conference, uh, but we did it simultaneously and without knowing each other. So it was not because of our work. But then when I contacted him, he studied our proposals and he wanted to comment on them. By the way, Dr. Hassan Janabi is an expert on water systems and desertification. Um, hello, good morning. This is Hassan Janabi, Iraq's ambassador to the UN agencies in uh, Rome. Uh, I just would like to uh, thank you all and wishing you uh, a very productive proceedings uh, this time. I would like to thank uh, uh, my friend Hussein Askari, who insisted on my involvement in this. Of course, uh, water, water and food uh, are interconnected, and if there is um, uh, proper access to water, then you would expect uh, the food production to be to be high, and uh, poverty level uh, would be pro uh, would be uh, would be lower. The um, area, particularly the Tigris Euphrates River basin in in West Asia. Uh, used to have uh, plenty of water uh, that historically used to flow to the Gulf uh, through, uh, through Iraq. However, starting in the 70s, major infrastructure have been uh, uh, constructed in the upper reaches of, uh, of the river basin, particularly uh, in Turkey, uh, Syria, and of course uh, um, in, in Iraq as well. What is particular on this is all these major infrastructures have been established without proper agreement between the riparian countries, all based on unilateral actions. And this is unfortunate in the Middle East where politics also is very, very high. So uh, with the over control on water, of course, the food and agriculture production became, became an issue. Uh, when it comes to investment, in my view, there's reasonable investment have been done in the river basins in Western Asia, particularly in the Euphrates and Tigris River, but this has been only uh, uh, invested in building infrastructure. So, uh, and those infrastructure have uh, major environmental uh, uh, impacts, so the environment was a victim of these major, major uh, investment, unfortunately. Desertification is a process that is, uh, that's also linked to the availability of, uh, of water. If there is water, so there is, there is a green cover, there are trees, production, agriculture, and, and, and what have you. So desertification is the process where the uh, natural processes could be mitigated. Uh, the natural processes causes of desertification could be mitigated. Uh, and the man-made causes of desertification uh, could be absolutely eliminated if a constructed efforts uh, taking place 
where programs are orchestrated between the, the uh, neighboring countries because it is, it is uh, um, not only national and regional phenomena, but it's also global, uh, global phenomena. When, but I suggest Iraq, of course, has been falling victim of, of uh, major desertification expansion uh, coming from the western part of, of, uh, of Iraq. What uh, has been suggested is to build a major green belt to stop basically the expansion of the desert into the historically fertile soil of the Mesopotamian uh, um, uh, land, which is at the western part of the uh, Euphrates River. So this is uh, what I'm suggesting is not only um, a reforestation um, uh, a project where millions of trees, more than 200 million of trees, uh, would be planted, but it's also a major development uh, project where environmental friendly technologies uh, have to be uh, used, human settlement, engagement of the uh, communities, uh, because social conditions and social involvement in these, um, um, uh, in these projects are basically the ingredient for a successful uh, desertification combating program in the country and in the area. So, uh, but this is national national initiative uh, that needs to be supported and that needs to be expanded across uh, across the region. Yeah. So, involving the community, uh, and but I'm saying in implementing this project, technology by itself and engineering is not the solution. It is part of the solution. The solution has to be much bigger than involving engineering and technology by basically involving the community, providing jobs, human settlement, a sense of responsibility, and, 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 sharing, uh, and, and, and sharing the benefit of that. So these are the ingredients for a major achievement in building uh, um, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, green, national green belt in, uh, in the Iraqi um, uh, desert. Schiller Institute initiative is, is, uh, is a highly respected approach for the uh, um, uh, issues of, of um, environment, poverty reduction, where you promote ideas of uh, you bringing together economy, uh, science, and uh, human, uh, human dignity. Actually, this is what needs to be promoted. This is uh, the approach where government and communities are involved in uh, improving uh, living condition uh, uh, for uh, that particular region as well as other regions. It is a future-oriented, future-looking um, approach so that the communities, the countries, the nations of the area are not stuck only in the past. So this is a way forward to improve conditions in, uh, in the area. Thank you. I, I just want to thank also our friends in uh, Italy who helped us uh, tape this uh, interview. But also I would very much thank the, all the translators. Usually they are forgotten in, this, in these processes. They are doing an enormous job. I think we should give them an applause. <laughs>